Am I doing this right? Huh? Oh god, I'm scared. Don't be scared. I'm scared. Don't be scared. <laughs> it's Tracy Lawrence. You should be scared. <laughs> I'm, I'm intrigued. Well, it's got to get okay, so I'm going to hide this here. Okay. And then we're going to talk about it. I don't know what it is, but I'm scared. Okay. I would be too. <laughs> I would be too. I would be too. Hey, hello, everybody. Welcome to Teal's Roadhouse. Excited in the house, Miss Ashley Cook. Hello, how are we doing? I am wonderful. So you can talk to a wall, huh? Something like that. Let's go. Come on. Oh gosh, are you wall now? I don't know. I'm not. Like... I just I, I've <laughs> I've been I've, uh, Easton Corbin just left a little bit ago, and he was like, <laughs> he was like on stun today. I, I awesome. tend to talk fast, so if I talk fast, just give me some more wine. It's all right. That'd be good. Good. <laughs> so I uh, I was I was here last night setting up all the podcast gear, and I, I was listening to your music, and one of the things that impressed me, you know, uh, I didn't hear any cheesy pop songs. I hear hardcore country, love gone wrong, heartbreak songs, and I was like, wow, that's pretty awesome. Thank you. From yeah. you, that means a lot. Seriously. I mean, real serious country songs. I was impressed. Thank you so Very much. Good. So where did your musical uh, influences come from? Man, I feel like I grew up all over the place, So, and my parents were into so many different kinds of music, so they listened to like Motown. So growing up as a kid, Motown was always on the radio, cool. on the boat, all that stuff. And then when like Taylor Swift and Rascal Flatts came along, I, I was obsessed with all of their stuff. And then I got into high school and so I'm aging myself right now, but got into okay. high school and started listening to like Florida Georgia Line and Jason Aldean yeah. and Luke Bryan. And honestly, Ed Sheeran was a huge insp inspiration of mine growing up too. Um, Where did the hardcore country elements, because a lot of the people that you just mentioned are a little bit more on the pop side. Correct. And, and I, I, I didn't notice it so much in the tracks, but I did in your vocal style and your delivery was a little bit more like like you've been through some turmoil and you had your heart broke more than once and you kind of had a little history. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. You know, it's crazy. I didn't, I didn't grow up listening to traditional country yeah. in a lot of ways. And so I think... For me, like, I'm not from like a super country place. I grew up all over the place, but I was born in Wisconsin, lived in California for a while, lived in Florida for a while. And so I'm not really from like super country places, didn't really listen to traditional country growing up. And I think listening to artists like Rascal Flatts, right, and like Taylor and people like that, it was the storytelling aspect that really got to me because I, I loved poetry growing up. Poetry was always my biggest thing. I loved the lyrics. Yeah. I loved the depth in poetry and in the lyric behind those kinds of songs and country music obviously is, is a storytelling genre. And so to me, I loved it. And it felt like what I wanted to say and wanted to write was country, whether I was or wasn't from a country place. You know? I've always, I say a lot that uh, I think country songwriters are like the last true American poets that we have. Correct. Uh, and just just the ability to, to really paint words and, and use words to paint pictures is really an amazing art form. Uh, and I've always been very passionate about it. And I like people that share that paint, paint, same passion. I know for me and, and, I, I'm curious if it was the same for you. When, when did you get to town? Oh, that's always a hard question. I first came to town when I was like 20, 2010, 2011. Yeah. And then I moved here officially in 2015. So for me, when I came to town, uh, I moved and got here in 90. Uh, and I had bounced around to several different places and played in bar bands and different things. Yeah. And I never felt like, uh, you know, you're, at least in my situation, I always like a second class citizen. Got evicted more than once, you know, yeah. have a steady income stream <laughs> when you're struggling yeah. and working a side job and all that stuff. 100%. When I got to Nashville, I rolled into town and for the very first time in my life, I found like I, I was just like all these other people. And I was overwhelmed by the fact that there was so much talent yeah. and so much creativity. And I was like, I'm freaking home. How, did, did you feel that feeling? Absolutely. I mean, when I first came to town, gosh, how old was I? Maybe 14, 15. I was really young and coming off of bouncing around different schools, homeschooling kind of all my life. My dad's job, he was in corporate, so we moved around a lot for yeah. that. And my sister, my older sister and I both were in entertainment really young. So when I first got to Nashville and played like Belcourt Taps, if you remember that venue, is the best venue ever, like on like 21st Belcourt Avenue and listening room. When it was when it was down in Cummins Station, like around that time frame. Yeah. I remember being there realizing like I'm so young and these people, I mean, they were, you know, twenties, thirties, forties, fifties age, and I was fourteen and I felt like we still I was more understood by them than I was anybody my grade, anybody my age, anybody at the schools that I was bouncing around from. There's something about music that connects everybody. There is, and, and when you find that common ground, and, and really uh, 
people that have that musical gift when you start writing songs at a young age and you just have the gift of word and melody and all that stuff, everybody really doesn't understand it. You know, there, people might love it and they might like to sing in the car, but there's an obsession that comes with it when you have that passion that it, it makes you like a, a little bit of an outsider and, and just in that, not, yeah. not in your social circles, but, but it's like, it's, it's a really different thing. 100%. And to find yourself in a situation where there's so many other people that are just as passionate is really a cool thing from collaborating. Oh my gosh. Just all those I mean, things. When I was, again, like, you know, 14, 15, I was writing on Music Row with Alyssa Moreno and Bridget Tatum and Jeremy Bussey and these writers that I've now become really great friends with, but I was a kid yeah. and they were writing with me because they believed in what I had to say. And that, I think that, that just proves that country music and storytelling can transcend any age or gap or whatever you're going through. You know what I mean? I do. It's just different. It's cool. So think about this. So in the last 10 years, the vernacular that we use has probably changed. I don't know how many new words like woke uh, I mean, all, all I don't the, use woke either. But, okay. but, but I'm just saying, think of all the words in the last 10 years that we never as a society used before. Do you try to find as a songwriter ways to put those things in or do you try to avoid them? Do you think they're kind of a, a, a sore spot? I mean, I, I'm, I know that's a strange question, but yeah. there's a lot of words that we use now in day-to-day to society that we hear on TV, on TV shows and the news and everything else that 10 or 15 years ago did not exist, at right. least not in the context that we use them now. It's an interesting question because there are times in a writing session when, you know, I'll be reminded somebody's like, oh, well, that might not be around in, in 10 years because that wasn't around 10 years ago. And you have to really think about that. I think it's always stick to words that are just concepts, things that can be timeless. Because there are songs that you hear from, you know, a hundred years ago, right? That people listen to and they're like, wow, I really relate to that. Or poetry that you read or books that you read that we are living a totally different life right now. Oh, yeah. So why not, why not use words that we're able to, you know. Would you use jukebox over playlist? <laughs> it's a great question. Well, the thing is, though, jukeboxes are still around. Not really. Not as much. Where? Where do you find it? Not I at, mean, at, you go at, to East Nashville, you'll find yourself a jukebox. Waffle, waffle House? <laughs> I but mean, you yeah. you still play it off your phone. I mean, yeah. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, Does Losers even have a jukebox anymore? I think they took it out. Oh, it should be I there. think because Patrick Thomas wanted to play uh, sad songs, so he'd go, like, put $20 in and make everybody angry. Now it's like that, the, the, what, the app. The app on your phone that you play, and it's like a, a sh- jukebox-shaped thing, but you walk up and, yeah. I mean, yeah, you're right. I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. I think personally, I'd, I'd, I'd just do whatever feels right in the moment. You remember that song, Bye Bye, that Phil Vassar wrote for uh, Jody Messina? Bye yeah. Bye. It's got a line in there about send me a fax or send me a letter, da-da-da-da, fax. And so there's one that we don't really use that much anymore. Well, nobody yeah. uses fax anymore. Yeah. Except for hospitals. Machines. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They always want you to fax the I just, I just think it's curious. We're in such a, a different day and age where there's just so much different stuff going on. Correct. And how much of it do you use and how much do you not? Because there's there's kind of a fine line sometimes where, where it, just to have a cheesy line that might strike a chord with somebody, or do you really want to paint the picture with what you're trying to say with the 100%. Words? Yeah. I think, too, you know, like I was saying, growing up on Music Row, I think I just learned so much being in the room. I really just was like a sponge as a kid and just soaked up how people wrote and what people wrote and how to say certain things, what to say. And I think I just kind of used my stories and my poetry and just kind of did what I wanted to do, you know. And that's it's a, it's a beautiful thing that I get to do as an artist, you know, and a songwriter. Yeah. So. So uh, how many albums have you dropped now? Actually, none. None. This just is EPs. I've dropped in one EP that was kind of like the length of it. It was like a seven song EP, eight song EP. But then this year, this July, I'm dropping my very first album. And how many shows are you doing? What what when you go out and work? What uh, what type of situations are you playing in right now? Right now, so this week actually, this Thursday, we start tour with Brett Young. So very it's nice. me, Brett Gotta Young. Do it with him, right? We do, yeah. And then Beautiful. you know another song hopefully soon. So we're we're working on a lot of stuff together. I love Brett; he's the best. Um, and then after that. I do tour with Luke Bryan. I'm going out with him, which I'm really excited about. Nice. Um, yeah, it's going to be a lot of yeah. fun. I'm, I'm pumped. And then festival season and my own headline tour. I mean, it feels like, I'm like, what is happening? Life is just going so fast. It's insane. Awesome. But, yeah, a lot coming up. Well, <laughs> let me tell you. So, uh, Lainey Wilson yeah. was one of the first guests that I had on the Roadhouse. I love Lainey. And uh, so, we, uh, right before COVID, she was out with me and Justin Moore. Yeah. And uh, she was out playing her acoustic guitar by herself, just doing the 20, 30-minute slide opening thing and just struggling and just got there hammering it out. And then she did the podcast, and then she just won a bunch of CMA awards and all of a sudden. Yeah, she did. (laughs) Yep. Life-changing. I'm telling you, life-changing to the point that it's never going to be the same again. It's amazing to watch it happen. That girl. She's... I dig her. She's one of those people who... 
when I first met her, interacted with her, we wrote a song together when I first met her. And I was like, man, she just, she was such a good mentor. Like, I remember this right before She's I went genuine. on. She's genuine. Oh, she is. Yeah. When I first went on my first radio tour, we were talking about it. And I was like, what do I, what do I need to know? How, like, I was, you know, brand new to this. Having, this is like last year, having no clue what to do. She was like, hey, watch out for this person, this city, do this, go to this place to eat, make sure you sleep, make sure you do this, eat this kind of food. And I was like, what? And she just knew. And she was so willing to like pass it to the next in line, like and immediately, which just like wanted to help. And she's just, she's so real. You're right. That's the word. She's she just is. Real. And uh, I'm just, I'm so proud to see good, genuine, talented people have good success. I, uh, I was listening to her album a, a few weeks ago. I was, I was at the gym. I said, I'm just going to listen to the whole album. I hadn't heard the whole thing yet. And I was so impressed with the imagery yeah. and just the vocal control and power that she had yeah. and uh, the production value. I mean, the record is really good. It's uh, it's to be traditional. I thought the production was really good. The solos and the and just the arrangements are very special and unique. Yeah. And I think that's really important right now because I think everything's starting to swing back to a traditional place. And to hear somebody that really has good traditional passion i think the production part is such a big thing to have the right producer that gives you the right the right caliber of songs because when you go out there are are when you go out now are you doing all original material you doing all your own stuff you doing a bunch of covers what are you doing just about yeah so like for example for the brett young tour we have a 25 minute spot yeah we're doing all originals there's like one i guess cover mashup you could say but it's it's my time to kind of tell my story see that's a word we've never used 10 years mashup, mashup. no i know i know it's one of those called a medley i know a medley <laughs> yeah, <that's> a ma- <laughs> when did that change that's i don't a really know i don't question. know if a mashup is really a medley though is it yeah i don't know but see i'm trying to learn too i got kids i have to i'm just trying to learn i'm, I'm ignorant to all how old are your kids i've got a daughter that will be 22 in june she's graduating june what uh the 27th oh i'm 12th Yep, she graduates uh, from college uh, in May. My youngest daughter's a freshman, and she'll be 20 in April. Oh, wow. Yeah, two That's girls. so cool. Yep. That's awesome. So let's talk. Uh, one of the things that I've been real curious about, uh, you know, as an artist that's been here over 30 years, I've uh, I've seen the major label side of the industry. Yep. Uh, I've been an independent artist for a long time. I've been self-managed. I've had great managers. Uh, I've seen... Uh, really good label heads that I had great experiences with. I've been on awful labels that I left meetings where I called lawyers saying, get me the out of here. Uh, the TikTok world is a completely different experience. And, and watching the way that it's being looked at by the industry and how it's bringing people in, it reminds me a little bit of, of American Idol and, hmm. and uh, The Voice, just how relevant that was when, that, when they would find kids that were hitting good numbers. Uh, how important has TikTok been to you and, what, and just kind of what was your path through that to get to where you are now? Yeah, honestly, I'm really thankful for it, for social media in general, whether it's TikTok or Instagram or YouTube. I think we're in a really unique time to be a young artist. I think it's it's the hardest and the best time to be a young artist, a new artist. Hardest because it's hard to break through the noise. There is so much coming out now where I think before, you know, you had to rely more on gatekeepers to get yourself out there, to get on tours, to do all of these things where you didn't have the funding for it or the, the eyes for it or you were so new, whatever it may be, now, living room, post a video, next thing you know, could be millions of people, could be one person, and you have to post another video and you just never know. I think it's it's so amazing because now artists have the access to be able to reach new people from their living room. They don't have to yeah. do all of the, you know, kind of older ways of, of doing things, which is amazing. But, I mean, I don't know. Personally, for me, I've been in music since I was 11. I was, you know grinding, writing songs, trying to figure it out in and out of Nashville, kind of growing up homeschooling and writing in Nashville and going to LA and just kind of being all around the entertainment industry as a whole. Moved to Nashville officially in 2015 to go to Belmont. I was a marketing major, so nothing to do with music at all. My senior year, I was like, all right, well, do I go get a job in marketing? Do I, like, what do I do? You know, like, I'm getting marketing offers. I have this degree. I could make a good amount of money. Like music is unreliable. Like as a new artist in Nashville, you just never know. This is 2019. And I'm like, all right, well, I'm just going to apply for this showcase at Belmont. There's a, this thing called the Belmont Country Showcase, which people in the past like Brad Paisley and Tyler Hubbard from FGL and, and they've all won this showcase. I was like, you know what? I'm going to just send it and just send it. Another thing that we say now recently, I'm going to just go for it. <laughs> and so I apply and I'm like one of the only non, non-music non majors to ever apply for this competition. I get in, top four. I'm like, what the heck? I win the competition. I meet my agent now, who was on the, the panel of judges then. 
And I was like, okay, okay, God, like if this is a sign, then I'm gonna try music. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it a full shot. I've done it a lot when I was a kid, but this is like my first time to really kind of give it like a full, you know, out of my parents' house yeah. try, right? Pandemic happens. So I'm like, oh no, I can't. Oh no, the wind down. <laughs> it's okay. Just wind let down, it go. Wind down. Just let it go. Um, but I'm like, man, you know, I can't go bust my ass in, in bars and see what I can do and, and make the fans, you know, face to face one on one, which I was extremely ready and extremely down to go do and put in the hard work. And it's definitely hard work, even, you know, what I have done, but I was down to do it the way that I've known for so long, which is, you know, you. You go in the bars, you play the shows, you maybe get a publishing deal, you network with some people, you write some songs, you maybe catch the eyes of some people to be an artist, to be on a label, who knows what happens. Like, just the process of how that all went, I was very down to do it. Pandemic happens, couldn't do any of it. Yeah. I couldn't go to Red Door to network, couldn't play shows, none of it. And so I go down to South Florida, where my parents lived at the time in 2019, or 2020 time frame, I guess this is. And... I'm like, I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm depressed. Like, I, I want to pursue music so badly. I want to get a, just do something. I'm out of college. I'm free for the first time in my life. Like, let's do this. And so one of my friends was like, hey, you should try this, like, TikTok thing. And I didn't, I was like, what, what? Like, YouTube? I know what that is. Like, I was confused, like, a video platform. I was like, all right, well, I'm doing nothing else but laying out by the pool and hanging out and trying to figure out when the world's going to get back to normal. So I'm in my parents' guest room. And I'm like, you know what? It's 2 p.m. I have no makeup on my face. I'm fresh out the pool. Let's just like see what happens. And I, I post this challenge called the Lay Me Down Challenge, which is like you basically test your octave, like your your range, um, on a on a video. And I post this video, and I'm like, okay, cool. Just post it. Go back to the pool. Don't think about it. A couple hours go by, and my sister was like, um, I, you might want to go check your your app. Like something something's happening. Like what? 200,000 views in like two hours. Ooh, wow. I'm like, what? Next thing you know, 500,000 views, a million in like a day. Like it was insane how much this video, my first video I ever posted. Wow. First video. And I was like, what the heck is going on? And so me being, you know, marketing brained, my dad is very business minded as well. We're both like, let's just dig into this and figure it out. And so we spend our quarantine like studying and figuring out the best times to go on a live stream. What even is a live stream? How do you even do that? How, I had no idea. I was very much shooting, you know, shot in the dark, a lot of stuff too. And so I, I kind of just figured it out, started going live and posting videos and studying the algorithm and failed and succeeded and failed and succeeded every day. I mean, that's the thing with TikTok is it's, you just never know what's going to work and what's going to fail. And to this day, I'm still, you know, people are like, what's the secret? You're TikTok. Blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know if there is a secret, but I'll tell you what, I, I think, uh, and I was going to, I was going to ask you this at some point, but talking about the marketing aspect of it, I'm telling you, having a background in marketing, I saw what Garth did with it. 100%. I had a lot of marketing stuff in college too that helped me a whole lot along the way. Just being able to have a natural grasp and understand why you get asked to do things and the relevance of them and how you make your brain process all that stuff, it makes a huge difference. There's so much more that goes into this career than just being able to stand on stage and sing a song. 100%. Because that's the stuff you do because you love it. The rest of it is work. The rest of it is what you have to do that you sacrifice for, the travel, all the things that you have to do, the early mornings and the late nights and all that stuff. That, that's what makes the artist who they are. And too, it makes me so sad sometimes, you know, knowing friends of mine in Nashville who are so talented, like oh, yeah. their writing skills, their performing skills, their voice, just so talented, but they're not succeeding right now. They're, you know, trying to figure out how to eat because they don't understand the world of social media or how to market themselves and nobody's helping them do it. Do you think you have to have a, a, some sense of it now as a young artist coming into town? I don't, I, I've heard rumors and, and I I mean, and I know they're true. People, management's told me and stuff. But there's a certain criteria with record labels that they won't even look at you unless you have so many TikTok or social media numbers. I hope that's not true. I hope that people can still take a bet on artists that maybe haven't had it all figured out. I will say whether you do or don't, you know, market yourself, have a whole plan behind it. I think it's important in a marketing sense to walk into a label, walk into a, a business that wants to do a business agreement with you and understand what you are and what you want to be. Because if you don't, they'll walk all over you and tell you what they want you to be and how they want you And they're you still going to try to do that anyway. Which is true. I mean, <laughs> fair. But I feel like whether or not you actually know how to you know, execute the marketing plan, I think knowing, hey, this is the, the lane that I want to fit in. This is where I want to go and how I want to market myself. Help me do that. But just the fact that you get a grasp of it, because I'm telling you, as a, as a small independent artist, and, and I've talked to several younger people that are doing the same thing. You, you, you walk into it, and you're 
shooting your own stuff, you're writing your own storyline, mm-hmm. you're doing your own songs, you're doing your own demos, you're doing either either garage band or whatever. So so much of it is contained. And then all of a sudden mm-hmm. something happens like what happened to you and you step into this world where you got a publicist and an A&R department and a promotion team and a label head and you're doing this. And I'd say it's, it's all of a sudden this world blows up and it can be really overwhelming for a lot of young kids. Oh, it seems like you got a real good grasp on it. Thanks. But but so much of it comes from having a, a knowledge and an understanding, whether it's from college or an upbringing or just. I, I always felt like I had a really natural grasp of it too, for some reason, because I didn't. I wasn't around any of this mess either. Yeah. But it was really interesting, uh, being able to walk into it and just kind of get a grasp of how it all works. And it's different from stage to stage. Uh, being a small artist on social media platform is very different than being on an independent or a major. It's a whole different world. 100%. And the demands and the expectations that are on you are very different too. I How are you adjusting to all that? Last year was definitely the craziest and hardest year of my life, you know? And I think to your point, you know, I grew up kind of doing this, you know? I, I was good friends with a lot of like the young Disney kids out in LA when I lived there when I was a kid. And I wasn't doing it myself, but I was friends with all of them and saw them getting paparazzi shots, going to dinner yeah. or whatever. I think I've just kind of always been around it. And I don't know if that's like a God thing of he placed me in situations where I had to be just kind of like acclimate, like, you know, watch it and see it all happening and just be around it. I don't know. I mean, I think you think you're ready till you're not. It's one of those things like this last year, signing my first record deal. I signed, I think, in like February, March to Big Loud Records. I sent me a radio tour. It was a lot. I mean, it was a lot. And I, I yeah. wrote a song called It's Been a Year about it because I just, I feel like I was on radio tour and also writing my first album and also on tour tour with Jordan Davis. I, w- it, I feel like I was a shell of a human in a lot of ways. And I think it's easy for the industry to kind of do that to you, especially in the beginning phases because, you know, you're in a van, sleeping on a van bench, going from show to show to then a radio tour to then, you know, meeting with the radio person for breakfast, lunch, and dinner then back to the show to go play a show and then a meet and greet because you're the, you're the newest artist out there. So you have to go to the merch table and, you know, bust your ass meeting people for a couple hours and really be present, at least want to be present. Yeah. It's a lot. And I think I'm now going back on tour this week um, and I from the holidays, really. And so I'm, I'm excited to kind of see, I've been to therapy. I've, been, I've kind of done all of the, the, the dirty work because, or the hard work, because like, if you don't, you can't survive. So who, who's, your, uh, who's your hang crew in town? Spencer Crandall's like one of my best friends. He's amazing. Alexandra Kay, who you were talking yep. about, yep. big big friend, big yep. fan of hers. She's great. Uh, Gable Bradley, if you know him, one of my mm. best friends, artist in town too. Um, Emily Wiseband, do you know her? I know Emily. Amazing yep. writer yep. friend, yep. amazing human. I feel like I, I'm one of those people that I feel like I, I kind of make friends with a lot of people. You know, Social like <laughs> butterflies is what we. Call yeah, them. yeah, yeah, you could say that. Absolutely. Yeah, I just love a lot of people. Yeah, I'm I'm really trying hard to kind of get uh, my head wrapped around and, and meet a lot of the younger folks that are in town because it's a it's a very different time than it was when I got here. Yeah. You know, uh, I, I I I have great memories of what Music Row was 30 years ago because because back then Music Row, 17, 18, 16, 17, and 18 were like this little bitty town right in the big of this big old city right in the, the just a small town in the middle of a big old city, and we ran the alleys and you know everybody publishing house and we'd pop in on people on chart nights on Monday and you kind of knew everybody's hang and it was just uh, it was so different back then and it's all just gotten so big now yeah it's it's really different than what you'll ever get back to that no, that's really sad no, it's gone it's really, really when they sad. when virgin hotel bills uh, a big hotel right past the naked people it's over yeah. <laughs> feel that <laughs> the naked people used to be a, a fountain and uh, i remember uh I, I after one of my number one records uh we used to have a record night at what used to be called the hall of fame lounge and me and some friends went out and put uh dishwashing soap in the fountain and it foamed up all over oh, the music room it was beautiful they never knew so who much. did it it was amazing we uh <laughs> you can't do stuff like that anymore yeah no you get arrested <laughs> I, yeah. went to, <laughs> I mean, maybe back then, too, but you just were good at running. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> no. <laughs> when I went to Belmont, we we all, like, went skinny dipping, like, the, <laughs> one of the nights that we <laughs> in the Fountain of Belmont. Because you, Did like, you really? I okay. mean, I feel like they're going to they're gonna like disown me as they're, like, you know, as an alma, mo- as an alma mater now. But. I'll never tell. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> oh, man. But it's, uh, I mean, it was uh, some fun times. It's, it's great to be young. Enjoy all of it. I mean, there's uh, all these new things and all the exciting things that are coming to you and the, the great friends that you meet. I mean, the friends, friends with common ground that you'll have for years and years and years, it's pretty freaking awesome. It's the best part about being friends with the people that I mentioned. And there's so many. Like, I could go on yeah. and on for, I mean, look at any of, like, the new class of Nashville. We pretty much all are friends, like Connor Smith, like Avery Anna. I mean, you, 
name anybody that we all know each so other. So I have to give Connor Smith a shout out. So sh- I did something yeah. so stupid. Oh. You know what I did? What? So Connor was on my podcast oh, uh, like wow. recently. Okay. So we went, uh, I was at the New Faces show. I was blessed. They gave me an award. It was really cool. Congratulations. And, and I uh, uh, I was making my rounds before the, the New Faces show started. And and I, I we were saying hello to everybody. And there was Connor. I said, hey, man, it's good to see you. I'd love to have him on my podcast. Blah, 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 blah. In my mind, he's Parker McCollum. Wow. In my mind, that was well. They Parker. toured together, and, and and then and I'm and he's looking at me like you are the dumbest person I've ever met in my life. Because I, I mean, it, just, it, and I walked away, and I got back up and said, "I'm you are so stupid." So, dude, Man. I did realize it after I walked away, but I, I apologize. Say, they look nothing alike. No, no, I'm nothing say. alike. But in my mind, that's what that's. And he looked at me like. He's like, what? I was just on your podcast. He's, he had, no, and he never even said anything. He just looked at me like I was so stupid. That sounds like, and Connor. I felt very stupid. Yeah. <laughs> so, but it did, it did register in my brain. It just took a minute. So, just I love that man. Yeah. I love him and Parker. Very, very They're both sweet, amazing humans. Sweet, sweet dad. I haven't met Parker yet. Oh, like, he, like you'll love him. Good. He's so, so, so kind. We've played a couple shows together. We become good friends. So, is Lower Broad fun to hang out, or is it just Lower chaos? Broad? Yeah. Uh, I, it's, 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 <laughs> I won't say it's not fun. I think it's just not the kind of fun that it used to be. I think it's now like woo girls and nightclub DJ vibes. So you have to explain to the world what a woo girl is. Oh now. boy! <laughs> I mean, I think you. It's not a derogatory a thing. Is. I mean, everybody what? needs to a what girl. Okay, a woo. W o o woo girl. <laughs> Basically, you know, like come to Nashville, spend ten minutes on Broadway, you will encounter many woo girls. It's called bachelorette parties. Bachelorette parties. Uh, They're the ones that are on like the the trucks, like yeah. the, uh, the, the the pedal tap, the Bicycle things, tip. the pedal taverns, or whatever. They have so many different kinds now. They have like a woo. fire truck. They have a hot tub truck. They have a whole thing. <laughs> they got tractors pulling. That thing cannot be clean. A hot tub truck? <laughs> ain't nothing, Imagine the kind ain't of nothing about any stuff. of us that clean. Like, <laughs> no, no, it's not. Yeah, I mean, it's fun. I mean, I'll go down there sometimes and, you know, hit it. You have to get in the right there. mindset. And, you do. Yeah. You do. That's the thing. Like, in and out. Uber. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Or, you know, go top floor, figure it out, get out, you know. but That's the way I feel about New Orleans, too. New Orleans, like Mardi Gras, if you can't be on a balcony, don't go. I've never been there. Don't. I've been to New Orleans to play a show, but we went, like, walked around the street, Bourbon Street, right? Yep. During the day. I spilled nothing but vomit and pee. <laughs> I was like, I and, and spilled don't know. hurricane. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's yeah. what they were trying to get us to do. And I was like, I mean, hey, I'm down, but it's like 2 p.m. and it smells like pee everywhere. I might throw up just from the smell. <laughs> but hey, I want to go try it out. Like, actually, go experience New experience. Orleans. Yeah, like for what it and is. Bill Street, and Bill Street. Street used to be cool too. You just have to be very cool. Always with a group of people. Never go by yourself. Yeah. You know the drill. That's true. So. Yeah. um, You've, you've brought up a lot of different aspects of entertaining. So I have to ask, uh, any acting desires? I mean, are you playing around? Are you doing some auditions? Any of that stuff going That's on? great question. I have not auditioned quite yet, but I used to do it when I was a kid. Um, I did, like, you know, a bunch of Nintendo Wii commercials when I was a kid. Really? Yeah, and my sister's an actor, so it's kind of in our family. I'd love to. I mean, I, I really would love to. My dream show is Outer Banks. I'd love to be, like, a guest appearance on that love show. Outer Banks. Me too. John me too. B, baby. Let's go. Come on. <laughs> I love Sarah. I, the, whole, the whole character. I mean, they're all amazing, and I feel like that's just kind of my vibe in a lot of ways. So I think it'd be fun to get that's to be on that cool. show. But, I mean, you know, we'll see. I think music is my number one priority right now, but... Entertainment, it all kind of it bleeds into each other. It does, uh, and it really, I mean, it's just uh, it's. I, I've dabbled in it some. I've done some really bad movies, and please don't look them up. So <laughs> I'm totally bad. watching them later. So <laughs> well, I'm, so I'm gonna call I've you and be like, Tracy, really I watched these. Ones. So very bad. Oh my gosh, it's, <laughs> okay. it's something to be ashamed of. But was it? It was fun though, right? To get to it experience was. It's, it. It's it's always fun. That's what I'm you saying. know, uh, the, the worst thing I had, uh, I was seeing, I was working with an acting coach out in LA for several years, and and uh, I did some audio. Casting directors are, excuse my assholes. They're the rudest, most evil people on the planet, and they were just mean to me. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't have to take this shit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah, it's, I get it. some of it's pretty rough. There was, I remember being a kid in LA doing auditions and stuff with my sister and whatnot. And it's, I mean, even as a kid, they're it's just they're brutal because I think they it's are too, brutal, but they. I think it's one of those things they see so many people throughout the day. They know what they need for their project. It's no excuse to be unkind to anybody, but like yeah. they're very much like. Get it done. We know we need what we need. McGraw and I were talking the other day, and he's you know, we. I wish I would have started doing more of it when I was younger, like he did, uh, because he told me he said I, I don't do auditions anymore. Yeah, <laughs> of course you I don't. Mean, yeah, you know, you, know? Yeah, like you don't have to do that. People anymore. already just know what they want. You know? Yeah, and and it does make a difference when you kind of get to that place where you've got a track record and you've got a body sure. of work underneath it. It does make a big it's, difference. It's fun to get to cross those worlds, like Lainey with Yellowstone. Like she crushed yeah. it because I feel like her the character. I mean, the whole story behind that too, and how it came about, and how she you know was music on the show, and then they met her and they got to know her and yep. wanted her to be a character. That's the dream, right? Because 
her character was very much her in a lot of ways too. And, yeah. and the music and, and you know, it was, it was cool to get to have that exposure for her in a different outlet, but that also stayed true to her brand and who she was. That's the goal. That's what I'd love to do on something like an Outer Banks or some show. I don't know. Absolutely. I can, that would be a lot of fun. Right? Uh, yeah, it really would. It would be fun. So any desires to uh, tour overseas, do any of that stuff? I'd love to. We just did C2C, the like What's festival, um, Country to Country. I don't know if you are familiar with it. Mm. It's really cool. They get like a, a festival of Nashville country artists to go over to, I think it's London, Glasgow, and Dublin, I want to say. Okay. And we just go over, you, you fly over, you're there for like... Like use, use a band or all acoustic or... I did all acoustic, yeah. but they have like main stage, they have side stage, they have all this stuff. We did like the spotlight stage. So we played there right before TR. Um, we did like a couple songs acoustic and it was really cool because we played like the O2 Arena. And I love that because me being this phase of my career, I couldn't afford to go tour over overseas oh, yeah, right now. Yeah. Being this young in my career, but because of festivals like that that pay you and allow you to, to you know, be over there... I now have been able to encounter UK fans that I wouldn't have before. So I'd love to. I'd love to go Australia, you know, the whole the whole nine yards. Is all of this everything you thought it was? No. <laughs> How so? There's just so much. I think, you know, I was talking to my, my mom about this the other day. Everything feels so different than what you think it'd feel. And I think for a long time you think, you know, oh, when I get this thing, then I'll, I'll feel like I'm content. When I hit this mile marker, when I get this, you know, song to get on this playlist or this song to go number one on the XM radio, or when I get, you know, this tour, or when I play this show, when I meet this person, you think it's going to feel this way and you think you're going to, you know, all of your insecurities and your fears are just going to go away. And then you do it all and you stand on those stages that you've watched people on TV do for so long or whatever and you realize like, whoa, these are all just human beings. I'm a human being. I feel no less or, you know, more than anybody else around me. And it's, you just, you start to really have this like undeniable respect for those that came before you. Not that you didn't before, but to me, it's like, holy, this is a lot well, see, to carry. And then you know? here's, here's that moment where you give advice to all these other people that are coming up. Happiness comes from within. It don't come 100%. from all this crap. Correct. It, it really does. And it, it's a hard thing to understand until you, I, this is a weird thing. And I, I haven't told too many people this, but I remember when my career first took off, all this crazy stuff was happening. It was just like all of a sudden all my dreams were coming true. Yeah. I literally went for about three years and I don't think I had a dream. I didn't have anything to dream about. Right. It like went away. And that's a really strange sensation to go through something like that and still not be totally happy. I think that the key to it, though, is that happy isn't always the absolute goal. I think that's what I've learned recently, too. Me and my phases of being really depressed, really left out, really sad, really ang anxious, really any of those things, that made happy feel like happy. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I happiness, if that's just the goal always. You're never gonna, you're never gonna know the difference. It's like you have to see the dark it, to see the without light. Without the struggle, then none of it matters. Exactly, and I think that's the thing too. Is you know, for example, you know, last year I got sick so many times, being in the van, feeling like I was just exhausted, and I'm like wow, getting back to be in my bed to lay down and, and watch a movie by myself, like, holy crap. And I look back and I'm like, I used to do this every night and took it so for granted. And then you have to go through all of that to understand what happy feels like, you know? So I think it's, the journey is all of the emotions and it has to be in order for it to be the journey, you know? Without a doubt. I understand completely. Yeah. I mean, and, and some, some journeys are longer than others. Uh, and, you know, even when you think you've made it sometimes, the old animal, Thing that they say sometimes you have to uh, crawl even after you walk. 100%. Some, there's highs and lows and they never really go away. But that's part of all the magic of it all. And I've, I've learned as I've gotten older sometimes to just, when I'm burnt out and I'm stressed and I'm fried, just take a breath, remember all the good things and all the things to be thankful for. Yeah. That's, that's the true way that you find peace in life, I, I believe. A, I mean, absolutely. I have a, a little album in my phone called Bad Day Blues. And so whenever, whenever I'm, you know, sad or depressed or whatever it is, I'll go in there and I'll, it's all like pictures and videos of my favorite moments with my family and friends and things that made me like cry laughing when I watch them. And it, no matter, like it always helps because you just remember like, wow, like this was such a fun time or fun memory, fun moment. And you, you look at that and it just helps a lot. So when you have those moments where you're just frazzled or, or you need something to just kind of get you back in line, is there a song that you go to? Is there like uh, two or three songs or maybe a period of, of music that you go back to that just brings it all back in line? That's a great question. Honestly, the FGL Here's to the Good Times record. And the reason why is because I remember being in high school and part of why I fell in love with like that kind of era of country and like, you know, the culture around it, like the fun tailgates and all that stuff. 
was because of being in high school, going to the amphitheaters, and that was the soundtrack to all of it. It was it was Luke Bryan, it was Aldine, it was FGL, it was you know all those people that would come through the Florida town that I was living in. Whenever I get you know pissed off or sad or whatever it is, if I listen to that record, I'm like, man, this. I just I remember the times in my life when I felt so carefree. I was, you know, being an idiot, making bad decisions, but remembering all of them and, and wanting to have a good time. You know, I think it's that. It's it's John Mayer. It's Ed Sheeran. Cool. It's all of that. I love, I just love their their stuff. It makes me feel happy, you know. Okay. Favorite comfort food when you get home when you've been gone a while? What do you, what do, you do? What do you, What do you make for yourself that you can't get anywhere else? Mashed potatoes. That's got to be mashed potatoes. <laughs> Not mashed potatoes. <laughs> um, man. <laughs> I'm a big like I love he- I love healthy food. So like I have an air fryer at home, which I don't have obviously in a van. Yeah. So I usually make like chicken and Brussels and like an air fryer. Um, but honestly, sushi is my favorite food. Uh, yeah. Maybe okay. that's I can you roll as, with you that. sushi people. Yeah. Okay, I'm like, are we sushi people? Are we not absolutely sushi. People? Okay, yeah, I'm a big sushi girl, and so I think you know, being on the road, I try to stay away from it because you just never know what will get you sick. Tell her. Nebraska sushi. I not a good thing. From that. You know, <laughs> yeah. we're, we're near the coast. I'm, I'm all for it. All for it. That's what I'm saying, though. Is like when I get home, even though we're still landlocked in Nashville, I just know like Virago. You're not really whatever. landlocked. I mean, you can get on Old Hickory and go all the way to Gulf. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a lake girl. I love the lake. But sushi from the lake sounds a little sketch. Yeah. <laughs> Bass sushi. Do you like crawfish? Never had it. Come on, girl. Never had it. Come on. You have to spend family, time in Louisiana. Get Laney to teach you how to eat the crawfish. My now. family, they, they'll tell you, we're such a simple eating family. Like, we don't branch out. I've never had ribs. <laughs> I've never had a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Well, oh, well. I've never had. Perfect. What, what are we doing? What are we doing? What are we doing? Uh, peanut butter and jelly Stop. sandwich. Stop. How'd you know? <laughs> Did you know this? Okay. okay. Oh, I'm scared. <laughs> This is a big so, moment, Tracy. This okay. is a big so, moment. I can cut the crust off if you like. I even got wheat. How, how do you take your PB and J? Oh, just like that. Okay, yeah. so you take it with so, the crust. And and it's creamy peanut butter. I do scared. have crunchy peanut butter, but it's just peanut butter. I don't and like gra- it. And grape jelly. Be honest. Out. Yeah, if you don't like it. I'm scared, guys. No. What are you scared? Of? <sighs> I've never peanut had butter one. and jelly sandwich. Peanut butter and jelly. Okay. It's like a I'm on Tracy Lawrence's bus. Might as well do something for the first time, right? There you okay, go. Let's do it. Really? You don't like it? She doesn't like it. What? She's trying to decide. (laughs) (laughs) It's good, I think. It needs you need milk. Yeah, milk's good with it. I don't love the jelly. You don't like jelly? Maybe it's the jelly you don't like. So when my wife was pregnant, she had this craving. It was the weirdest stuff I've ever heard. She woke up in the middle of the night, she said, I want a peanut butter. And pineapple sandwich. That sounds delicious. We had a fresh pineapple. She wanted a fresh sliced pineapple. We wanted me to cut the pineapple up. She wanted me to cut the crust off the bread and lightly toast the bread. (laughs) Oh, yeah. You did it. Oh, of course I did it. Okay. I just wanted to see. I always had peanut butter sandwiches growing up. Like, just peanut butter and bread. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. It's the... (laughs) I'm like... She's done. Yeah. Well, thank you. First time having one. Try the wine back. Yeah. I'm like, let's let's (laughs) wash this one down. But... I just had to try. (laughs) No, I think it's the jelly. I think it's something about like the jelly. I feel like okay, so are you like a like candy? Are you a chocolate candy or are you a fruity candy kind of person? You know, I like uh hard candy. I love Charms Blow Pops, I love Skittles. Uh I but I do like chocolate. I like uh almond kisses. Okay. Uh I, I like I like candy. But my favorite's like apple like apple tarts and stuff baked in the oven. Yeah. Pepperidge Farms made these little apple turnovers. <laughs> See, I can't get into it. <laughs> Why not? Something, something about <sighs> You don't like, like cobbler or anything like that. I feel like fruit shouldn't be warm. <laughs> yeah, that's nice. Does it make sense? Okay. Well, not, well, like, I'm not a big pineapple I'm on pizza I'm, kind I'm of girl. I'm what you're putting down. <laughs> yeah, I feel like fruit is, like, refreshing and cold. And then when you put it in, like, a pie. I mean, apple pie, I can so, get down with. Uh, you're, you're into so smoothies and stuff. Love smoothies. Yeah, there you go. Love them. Okay. Yep. Yeah. You're like smoothies yeah. and I- <laughs> I acai bowls. Stuff. No. I'm, yeah. I'm, no, I mean, yeah. apple pie I can get down with. I don't know why. Something about it. It's just a little bit different. But I like it cold. I'll eat just about anything. I, I mean, <laughs> I'm just- Both with- Well, he, he's got a juicer. Okay, yeah. He looks like I, I, a juicer kind of guy. Yeah, you do. I was more wondering if you've never had warm blackberry cobbler. No. With oh. some vanilla ice cream. No. I like Where pumpkin else? pie. Yeah. So but I eat it cold. Yeah. And I like apple pie, I like it cold. 
right. Is that weird? I mean, uh, maybe a little. It's okay. <laughs> it's, hey, we it's all have our fruit. judgment here. It's, it's all right. fruit. You want to? Have I ever told you my comfort food? Let what me is tell it? you. Okay. Go for it. So when I mean, I, I didn't have a lot. So when I was in college, I mean, I would literally. Uh, I would buy the cheapest winnies that I could buy, like the old red dye winnies, like like nine and you get three of them for ninety nine cents, three packages. And I would get cheap a cheap bag of potatoes and cheap English peas. So I would boil the weenies, so I'd get all the dye out of them. Then I'd fry the French fries, and then I have English peas. So that is still my English co- peas, English peas, French fries, French fries, and hot dogs, and, and boiled weenies. So that is still my comfort food when I come home. Except I eat turkey weenies now and a lasur peas. And I and I fry my stuff in like I love that. Cologne oil. That cologne. sounds yeah. terrible. It's I love awesome. That. With some damn I love that ketchup. for you. <laughs> See, I love that for you. I think. See, I, that's weird. That's just weird stuff. French fries are good. See, that's just weird stuff. I'm trying it's to turkey like weenies. <laughs> There's like <laughs> turkey weenies. Yes. Yes. There's They're healthy. My, my mom. My mom is. My mom does not cook ever. She's gonna hate me for saying this on here, but yeah. she does not cook. She like hates cooking. Her one thing that she does cook is a turkey pasta. It's like ground turkey with like, like tomato sauce, whatever you call it, marinara sauce. I don't know, whatever it is. You don't cook either. And the, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Just okay, got a lot. I'm just checking. <laughs> I mean, I'm on the road, okay, Tracy. But but no. So I mean, whenever I come home, that's like my go-to meal. I'll put like, like penne pasta into like a turkey marinara situation and I get call it. it dinner. That's like my go. That's my comfort food, I guess you could, you could say. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna challenge you. Weenies. So my okay, turkey me. fry. In November, yes. Thanksgiving week, I'm going to teach you how to fry a turkey. How do you fry it? I thought you bake a turkey. No, you fry a turkey. Is this what you put in the thing and it makes the fire go boom? Yeah. No, you don't. The fire does not go boom. <laughs> no. I've seen videos of people. Yeah. Are you yeah. slow? slow? I've seen people, people like drop the turkey in and yeah. it's like, oof. So, so we, had, we cooked 1,200 turkeys this past Thanksgiving. We fed hundreds and hundreds of people around Nashville. I love that. We had over 250 volunteers. We cooked 1,200 turkeys. We had 120 fryers going at one time, so it was awesome. All this, it was pretty cool. So you have to come. I'd love teach, to come volunteer. To teach you how to draw, teach you how to fry a turkey. I would love that. I would fried seriously turkey love that. is the best turkey there ever was. It's really good. It's I'm going to try it. It's very See, good. my family, give you a little, little they're going to hate me. They're literally going to Tell me all the good stuff. I want to know. They quite literally call, like, Publix. And order the already pre-cooked and pre-sliced turkey that just like for is ready to go. Yes, and then they do like the microwave mashed potatoes. They're, no, they're, no, they're, no, no, no. There are those kinds of people. No. Yes, that's my so family. So, do you is it stuffing or dressing? My, honestly, I eat the stuffing, but it's again we don't make it. It's like you get it from the store and you microwave it. My my parents don't like stuffing. <laughs> Dude, I'm telling you, my parents are not like southern like home cooking people. They're like I'm midwestern sure. people that like they're weird in the best way. But like so they don't you do, do that. Do you know the difference between a sweet potato and yam? No, I make sweet potato casserole every year. But I what's a think, yam? I don't. It's a sweet potato. <laughs> so it's the same thing. <laughs> You're trying to trick me. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> See, I'm the only one that eats the sweet potato casserole. And my like mom, my mom, either. like refu- my mom refuses to eat quinoa because she's like it just sounds weird. Quinoa. Quinoa's good. So I su- think so too. But she's sweet, against it. Your sweet potato casserole. Uh, marshmallows on top? 100%. You do brown sugar, marshmallows, a little bit of like crushed pecans on top. So I was thinking you were anti-sugar because you, you weren't about the cobbler stuff. So I'm just making <laughs> sure. I'm telling you though, it's like fruit sugar. We have gotten completely off. We have. Yeah. It's okay though. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. We're here. It was the jelly, man. It was so, the jelly. <laughs> it was the jelly. <laughs> it was the jelly. <laughs> oh my goodness. So have you ever ever fished? Do you ever hunt? Do you- I love fishing. Okay. I've never gone hunting. I want to really bad. Okay. My parents just are not those kind of, I mean, they're like for it, they just haven't never done it. Freshwater um, fishing or saltwater fishing? Freshwater. Okay. I've gone deep sea fishing before. I went off the coast of the Keys um, when I was in high school, and it was a lot of fun. I loved it. But these are awesome. Oh my fishing gosh. is amazing. The absolute there. best. Yes, yeah. It is. But I love. I mean, we used to have like a little lake behind our backyard with a bunch of alligators in it, and we'd go skinny dipping in that lake all the time with the alligators. Don't ask questions. It was weird. Um, <laughs> not like with them, but we knew they were in there. You knew they were there. Yeah, we knew they were in there. Um, uh, we, I love to fish. Like. Bass fishing, I love it. It's so much fun. So do you miss a lot of that stuff, traveling? I really do. A little bit? Honestly, though, when I moved to Nashville, I didn't really get to do a lot of that anyways. I think, I mean, I drive like a, a Jeep, and I used to have a lifted Jeep. Hopefully going to lift this one soon. I just got a new one. Um, and I used to go, like, off-road trails and camping and all that stuff in Nashville. But now it's like, when, you yeah, know? You just don't have time anymore. Yeah. That's part, part of it. You get successful. You make money. You buy toys. You don't have time to use the toys. That's what I'm saying. So they sit and they ruin. And then you so, buy more toys. Yeah. yeah that's what completely. Happens. I do miss it a lot. Yep. I think I, you know, I think the 
the key to it, though, is finding time to do those things on the road. Like, whatever time you have. Like, even if it's just laying out in the sun for five minutes. Like, just having time to kind of, like, regroup and do what you need to do. You know, it's uh, something I think is really important is learning to find a balance of being able to make time for yourself and establishing even if it's, if it's a day a week that you keep for yourself that you don't let anybody else have. I never did that when I was younger. I try to make it a point to do that more now as I've gotten older. But if you don't do that, you lose yourself. And you wake up one day and 10 years have gone by and it's like, where did it all go? You, you want to... You just want to say yes to everything, especially at this phase, because it might not be an, an option in a year, you know? I think it's tough, um, but I hear you. It is, and and uh, the, the thing about being young, you have more energy <laughs> to do all those things than you do as you as you kind of get older and you kind of are, are able to be a little bit more selective. Just uh, something to keep in the back of your mind as you grow, as you go through the whole process. For sure. I think you're going to do fine. Thanks. Boys, you got anything you want to ask this young lady? Hit me. Yeah, that song... Uh, it's been quite a year, but it's... What's the name of that song? It's been a year, yeah. It's been a year. See, I heard it's been quite a year. Oh, Even really? though you didn't say that. Huh. It was just kind of like... Like in your head? It's been that's a hell of a year. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. That's what you heard Which in your head? Which is kind of the... Yeah, that's and like so the... That was a well-written song. Did you write that like all at once, and was it based on a real thing? And it was. Or yeah. Was it over time that it developed, or how did that song come to be? It was awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah that was in a writing session in Nashville. It was actually kind of wild how that song came about. Um, what we're talking about, just kind of tough, just figuring out this new kind of world of artistry that I'm in now. Yeah. I was kind of wrestling with it all and thinking about it all and trying to head to a right and, and you know, not be exhausted and, and find some kind of creative inspiration on in the midst of touring and all this crazy stuff. And my mom called me. And she was like, hey, Ash, I hate to say this, but your grandma just got diagnosed with breast cancer for like the second time. And I was like, man, I, I hate that. And I, I was thinking about the last time I had seen her, my grandma. And it was bizarre because I looked at my calendar and I realized it had been exactly a year from the week since I had seen my grandma last in Florida. I was like, that's weird, but okay, moving on. Like, I'll think about that after this write. I have to go to work and go write a song. And so I, you know, Walk in the room, and I'm talking to the co-writers, and it was, do you know Brett Tyler? You familiar with him? Brett Tyler, Will Weather, amazing, amazing writers. Um, and Brett, I didn't tell them this, this thought about my grandma and everything. Brett goes, hey, I have this idea for a song. I don't know if you, you know, if this does anything for you, but it'd be called It's Been a Year. And I was like, okay, this is too weird. Like, I just thought about the fact that it was a year since I'd seen my grandma, and she has breast cancer now. And so I, I told them the whole story, and I was like, we well, got to start the song about my grandma like in the first line is it's been a year since I've been back to Sarasota yeah. and all that stuff and it's not the song isn't about my grandma it kind of became just about how crazy this last year the 2022 had been um but the day that I released the song she was declared in remission from breast cancer like that day that's amazing nuts but it, really that song to me was kind of my way of coping with all of this, you know? Hey, songwriting sessions sometimes can be better than therapy sessions. 100%. Especially if you're in a group of collaborators where everybody's, there's a comfort level and you, you, you've you learned to share a lot of things. Because sometimes, it's, it's hard to explain that to somebody that doesn't write. When you walk into a room and you have that comfort level and you've got stuff going on in your life and you're just kind of purging things out and talking about, especially as you get ready to write, if you're searching for an idea, sometimes just getting all of that stuff out is so freaking healthy. So good. Yeah. Like, there was this one song called Running Back that me and a couple writers wrote, and yeah. in that, that instance, same exact thing, we were in the room just talking, like just talking about how it's hard to move on sometimes because you have your ideas set on this person from the past or whatever it is, and the idea of running back just kind of came out and we all were like we all have those people we're all happily you know with other people seeing other people whatever it is and we all were like man like that is so relatable and then that happened so you're right it's it's a cool way to bond also with other people that are creatives and writers too it know? really is because you uh it seems the more vulnerable vulnerable you make yourself the more productive you can be 100 it's, it's a very cool experience it's special i've really enjoyed getting to know you i have too Thank uh you. tell me all your socials all my socials are pretty much just at the Ashley Cook with an E. It's like gotcha. cookie without the I. So right. easy to remember. Brett Young? Yeah, going out with Brett starting this week. And then Luke Bryan. Where's your, where, where are the first shows? Columbus. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> it's Columbus is the first show. Okay. I know that. Um, and then I'm going to the CMT Awards, all that stuff. But Columbus is the first show, and there's like just all around the country. 
We have so many shows. I wish you all the best. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, in a year from now, I hope we get a chance to sit down and update me on all the things that have happened in your life and your career, because I think you're going to do great. Thank you. Pleasure. It means a lot from you, seriously. Thank you for having me. Ashley Cook. Thank you.